few franchises have a concept as evocative as The Purge. The allegory-heavy property puts forth the premise of an annual 12-hour period in which all crime in the U.S. is legal, an idea introduced with the series' first movie in 2013. The fourth movie, The First Purge, takes audiences back to the first experimental instance of what would later become a violent tradition. Set in the New York City borough of Staten Island, the horror-thriller hybrid provides the clearest look yet at the beginnings of The Purge as a national institution. If you're not sure that you picked up on everything the movie was putting down, stay with us as we break down the ending and thematic takeaways of The First Purge. Defend the Neighborhood Act 3 of The First Purge turns into a full-on action movie as drug kingpin Dimitri storms the towers of the Park Hill housing projects to protect his friends on the 14th floor. By this point, the movie has officially turned from a citizen-on-citizen -citizen free-for-all into a government-sanctioned extermination campaign as the international militia hired by the NFFA begins clearing the building floor by floor. It's dramatic irony that the only defender of the vulnerable people in the housing project is the friendly neighborhood narcotic salesman, who apparently happens to spend every moment away from his business lifting weights, eating protein, and getting insanely good at using firearms. Far from the typical media portrayal of a drug dealer, Dimitri is a homegrown Batman figure, his neighborhood's wealthy, well-equipped, most capable defender. Unlike the hyper right-wing government and ruling class that is literally trying to kill the neighborhood, this businessman-turned-warrior is an authority figure who values his community and keeping people safe. He's not your typical protagonist, and it's one of the things that makes this particular Purge installment so intriguing. Intentional Extermination After two acts worth of tension in the streets, the government takes the gloves off for the movie's brutal finale. At this point, the undercurrent of class warfare and exploitation that's informed the whole series is revealed in all of its ugliness, as The Purge is identified as a tool for exterminating the lower class. The event isn't a solution to society's problems, but a scapegoating of society's weakest, with free passes going to the forces in control that are actually to blame. In a country where the economic divide between the upper and lower classes has never been more dramatic, this is a message that resonates. In our very real world, the poor are often blamed for their own circumstances, instead of the predatory forces that exploit them and keep them down. In the just slightly heightened world of The Purge, they're not just blamed for their own poverty, they're intentionally exterminated. Lords of War The NFFA isn't just relying on its private militia to exterminate the poor. In order to make sure that the experimental first purge actually pops off, the government injects a massive influx of heavy weaponry into the Staten Island black market. Most of these weapons are handily requisitioned by Dimitri's staff, who use the arsenal for their own counteroffensive against the government-sponsored invaders. This plot turn speaks to a number of tactics that have been used, allegedly or not, by the U.S. government. As the first purge establishes, the NFFA believes that death needs to happen on a massive scale during the experiment in order to create the political capital for a national purge. To achieve that end, they're willing to covertly arm the population with heavy artillery. It's a fact that the U.S. government sends weapons all over the place to aid with causes, nations, and groups that it supports around the world, directly fueling conflicts for its own benefit. In the first purge, the government sends out arms to exterminate its own people, another instance of the movie taking something real and adding a sinister twist. Signs of Violence The first purge clearly wraps the government and its allies in recognizable symbols of white supremacy, taking the racist undercurrent that's always been associated with the purge and making it explicit. It's not just a class war the NFFA is gunning for, it's a race war with a Nazi-esque mission. It's no accident that the fourth purge movie features a cast, according to producer James DeMonico, that's 90% black, because the theme of white violence against black communities is at the heart of what the movie's trying to convey. The movie plays with potent iconography. To help spread violence on Staten Island, the government lets in goons with red, white, and blue KKK hoods, evoking decades of history of racist violence. Blue-eyed, blonde-haired, government-sanctioned militiamen wear blackface masks or dress like SS officers as they attack the Staten Island community. Acts of violence in the movie uncomfortably evoke real-life hate crimes, with attackers bearing torches and wearing crosses that clearly evoke recognizable hate symbols. It's heavy stuff that the movie doesn't always deploy gracefully, making for bracing moments that get way too real. Be All Right The movie ends in fire as the showdown in the Park Hill projects comes to a violent, C4-fueled conclusion. The end of the fight just happens to coincide with the end of the 12-hour experiment period. Just like that, the island is returned to a state of relative calm. 
After the shootout, Dimitri, Naya, Isaiah, and Dolores join the crowd outside in the light of dawn, reconnecting with the community after the night of violence. Instead of tearing each other apart as the NFFA intended, the citizens defended each other. A moral victory, if nothing else. As the movie ends, the purge is over. Now, to paraphrase the movie's final words, it's time to fight. The movie's hopeful ending stands in contrast to what we know about where the story is going. The residents of Staten Island don't succeed in stopping the purge from spreading nationwide, and the tradition doesn't end for years, or potentially decades. Despite this, the movie concludes to the hopeful strains of Kendrick Lamar's All Right, a modern-day anthem of resolve and resilience that's used now to represent resistance. No matter how many purges happen in the future, people will always try to help each other and survive. People will always fight back. In a series this bleak, that's a victory in itself. Thanks for watching. Click the looper icon to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Plus, check out all this cool stuff we know you'll love too.